Today, we are going to begin building our model of how consumers make decisions. Ultimately, we will use this model to generate estimates of consumers' market demand and to predict the outcomes of market interactions between producers and consumers. Models of consumer decision-making in economics are based on the assumption that consumers are rational, which means that they choose the combination of goods that they like the best out of the ones that they can afford. Thus, in order to have a useful model, we must be able to, de to describe two things. First, which combinations of goods are affordable for the consumer? And second, out of these combinations, which combinations does the consumer like better? We will start building our model with the simplest piece, which is the description of the combinations of goods that the consumer can afford. We call this description the budget constraint. By the end of this chapter, you should be able to do the following things. First, you should be able to develop a formula for and graph a consumer's budget set and budget constraint. Second, you should be able to analyze the effects of changes in prices and income on a consumer's budget constraint. Third, you should be able to explain the effects of changes in prices and income on the consumer's budget constraint and also explain whether or not the effects of these changes make sense. Fourth, you should be able to modify budget constraints to reflect the effects of different government policies. And finally, you should also be able to modify budget constraints to incorporate alternative constraints that might affect a consumer's decision making, such as quantity restrictions or ethical constraints. We call the combinations of goods that a consumer can afford the budget set. In order to more carefully think about the budget set, it is helpful to first define some notation. Normally, we will represent the amount of a good that a consumer purchases with the letter X followed by a numerical subscript to differentiate one good from another. However, notice that there are alternative forms of this notation that we could also use. For example, we could use letters instead of numbers for subscripts, or we could simply use different letters to represent the different goods that a consumer buys. We will be using all three types of notation during various parts of this class, so please try to be flexible when it comes to thinking about notation. No matter how we represent the quantities of goods that a consumer buys, we will always use the same letter to represent a consumer's income. That letter is the letter M. You may be wondering why we're using M to describe a consumer's income instead of I. In economics, the letter I is reserved to describe the interest rate, so we use M for income. Similarly, we will always use the letter P to represent the price of a good, and we will let our notation for prices correspond to the notation that we're using for quantities of goods. So for example, if we're using numerical subscripts to represent different quantities of different goods, then we will also use numerical subscripts on the prices. If we're using letters as subscripts, we will use the same letters on the prices to represent the price of each good. And if we're using different letters to represent different goods, then we will use those letters as the subscripts on the prices as well. So these three pieces, prices, income, and quantities of good, are all the pieces that we need to build our model of which combinations of goods a consumer can afford. To start simple, if a consumer buys X1 units of good 1 and the price of each unit of good 1 is P1, then how much money has the consumer spent? Hopefully, it is obvious to you that the answer is P1 times X1, the price per unit multiplied by the number of units that the consumer buys. We can easily extend this idea to multiple goods and multiple prices. If a consumer buys X1 units of good 1 at price P1, and X2 units of good 2 at price P2, and X3 units of good 3 at price P3, etc., then the total amount of money that the consumer spends on this combination of goods is just going to be the sum of the amount that the consumer spends on each of the individual goods. In order for this combination of goods to be affordable, 
it must be true that this sum is less than or equal to the consumer's income, M. We call this last equation the budget constraint. For now, we're not going to permit consumers to go into debt in order to be buy a given consumption bundle, so the most that a consumer can spend in a given time period is his or her income, M. In many real-world applications of consumer theory, economists work with a multi-good model such as the one that you saw in the previous slide. However, for the purposes of thinking about the problem of consumer choice and developing a model, all of the interesting results can arise from a simpler model that only has two goods, good one and good two. So, in the interest of simplicity, we will focus on these two good models. We can easily extend the two good model to the multiple good model by letting one of these goods be the good that we're interested in finding the consumer's demand for, and the other good simply represent the amount of money that the consumer is spending on all the other possible goods that she could buy. In two dimensions, the budget constraint is simply P1 times X1 plus P2 times X2 is less than or equal to income, M. If the consumer spends exactly all of her income on these two goods, then we have the budget line, P1 times X1 plus P2 times X2 equals M. Using only two goods to represent the budget constraint has an additional advantage in that it gives us a model that is easy to draw. In order to draw the budget line, first, draw a set of axes. Second, put the quantity of one good on one axis and then the quantity of the other good on the other axis. It doesn't really matter which good goes where. The easiest way to figure out where the line goes is to find the endpoints. Note that if a consumer spends all of her income on good one, then she can buy her income divided by P1 units of good one. This would define the horizontal intercept of your line. Similarly, if a consumer spends all of her income on good 2 and buys 0 units of good 1, then she could buy M over P2 units of good 2. This will give you the vertical intercept of the budget line. Once you have the two endpoints of the line, simply connect them to find the budget line. Another way to find the graph of the budget line is by putting the equation for the budget line into slope-intercept form. First, start with the equation for the budget line and then solve for the vertical axis variable, which is x2. When we do this, we find that the vertical intercept is income divided by the price of good 2, just as we did in the previous slide. In addition, we see that the slope of the budget line is the coefficient of the horizontal axis variable, x1. The coefficient of x1 is negative p1 over p2. The slope of the budget line tells us the amount of good 2 the consumer will have to give up to get one more unit of good 1. For example, if the price of good 1 is $6 and the price of good 2 is $3, then the slope of the budget line is negative 2. This means that the consumer will have to give up two units of good two to get one more unit of good one. Another way to think about the slope of the budget line is that it measures the opportunity cost of good one. In fact, it will always be the case that the slope of the budget line measures the opportunity cost of the horizontal axis good. This rule also applies more generally to other lines and curves that we will develop in this course, so it's a useful rule to remember. Because the budget line satisfies the equation P1 times X1 plus P2 times X2 equals income, if a consumer is consuming a combination of good 1 and good 2 that lies on the budget line, then she is spending exactly all of her income at that point. However, points to the northeast of the budget line are unaffordable. The consumer does not have enough income to purchase these combinations of good 1 and good 2. Finally, points inside the line, the consumer has money left over. Thus, all points on the line and inside the line are affordable for the consumer. 
The set of affordable combinations of goods one and good two is called the budget set, which is the shaded triangle in this slide. Now that we have established the basic model to represent the set of affordable combinations of goods for the consumer, we can start to analyze how changes in prices and income affect the budget line and the budget set. If a consumer's income falls, but prices remain unchanged, then the slope of the budget line will not change, but the consumer will not be able to buy as much of each good. Thus, a decrease in income results in a parallel inward shift of the budget line, and the budget set is smaller. Similarly, if a consumer's income increases, but prices remain the same, the result will be an outward parallel shift of the budget line, and the budget set is bigger. Hopefully this makes intuitive sense, because when your income goes up, you are able to afford to purchase more things. If the price of good one increases, but the price of good two and income remain the same, then if the consumer spends all of her money on good one, she will be able to buy fewer units of good one. However, she will still be able to buy the same amount of good two if she spends all of her income on good two. Thus, in this case, the budget line will pivot inward. Similarly, if the price of good two increases, but the price of good one and income remain the same, then the budget line will pivot downward to reflect the consumer's reduced ability to buy good two due to its increased price. You should think about what would happen if the price of one good were to decrease instead of increase. What would happen if both prices change? If some combination of prices and income change, you will have the opportunity to practice analyzing the effects of some of these changes in your team exercises. Generally speaking, the effect of taxes or subsidies on a consumer's budget depends on whether the tax or subsidy affects prices or income. If the tax or subsidy affects income, then all or part of the budget line will shift as a result. If the tax or subsidy affects prices, as is the case with, for example, sales taxes or the gas tax, then the budget line will pivot. You should familiarize yourself with the examples of the effects of taxes and subsidies on the budget line in section 2.6 of your textbook and be prepared to analyze similar scenarios uh, in your team exercises in class.